computer, how does it work? Did it should have gone to the cloud? She does. Uh, Sammy did it. Okay. Hi, welcome to Recordando. A los que fueron convicted. Uh, that was my very bad pronunciation of uh, this this month's theme, and um, but it's being recorded, so we're good. Tammy Gomez is joining us tonight, um, completely mute or muted. Uh, although you know, there's there's far less mutation <laughs> um, than you might think with Tammy. <laughs> And here's Lorraine. Lorraine, let us know when you can um, hear us or when you're speakable. <laughs> the horror movie, not to celebrate the release of the silent movie, the horror movie one. Yeah. <clears throat> Lorraine, turn on your sound a moment and say hello, if I may request. I'm not sure Lorraine is with us yet. Well, um, Tammy's um, set up the uh, theme this uh, month uh, to be convicted, uh, which I, I think we can also translate as um, something uh, felt or said with conviction. Um, but um, uh, uh, just before we started recording, Jeffrey Pullis and I were having a discussion of um, Kant's anthropology writings, which were <laughs> apparently fictional lies and uh, it made me think of i'm going to bring something to our screen for a moment to sort of start us off um now this may be something that everyone here is already familiar with um uh lorraine if you're trying to speak you're on mute uh, i'm i'm uh, i'm the uh surrogate host for this evening and my name is richard something um oh you can't unmute lorraine right. can't unmute <laughs> okay. Is Lorraine muted by us, by by whoever is hosting? Question. Um, because I don't normally host, I have to take a look uh, and see if I can see if there's anything I'm missing here. Participants. Um. It says ask to unmute, but it doesn't allow me to. And it also says that Tammy is not muted at all. Yeah. Um, so I don't see anything. Uh, Tammy's trying to Lorraine right now. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, Tammy, you might have the, the helm there. Okay, sorry, folks, to start out with a little confusion, but um, we do enjoy a little confusion now and then um, <laughs> because... You know, c'est la vie. And uh, anyway, um, we were talking about anthrop anthropological ex exhibitions for a moment. And we also have the theme of convicted or convictions. And so I'm going to share screen for a moment just to get us started, if I may. Um, and there it is. So I, I, are you folks familiar with this? Um, kind of wonderful, if that's the right word for it, performance art piece uh, from 1992 and 1993. You, I bet Tammy is familiar. It looks like you are. Um, by Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Pena, uh, who um, pretended to be undiscovered um, South American peoples uh, and, and lived in um, a cage uh, for periods of time in a number of cities. Uh, to celebrate the quincentenary of Columbus's arrival to the Americans. And of course, they were just, um, you know, um, they were not undiscovered Amerindians. They were, you know, performance artists, but they lived in cages with like, well, they have uh, descriptions here, outfitted in primitive costumes, uh, designer sunglasses, a cheetah luchador mask, uh, leather boots, face paint, long wigs, grass skirts, necklaces, etc., and performed uh, traditional tasks of their people, which were entirely fictional. Um, and but the thing was, you know, let me see what it says. Um, if it says uh, they presented themselves as previously undiscovered Amerindians from a fictional, uncolonized island, and um, 
I'm um, trying to see um, how long they were in different places. But the amazing thing was um, that they would, well, they would, yeah, tra their traditional tasks include watching television, sewing voodoo dolls, using a laptop computer, pacing back and forth, eating or being fed fruit, and people would pay to feed them fruit. I know that I know this part, having read actually a long article by Coco Fusco about the experience. And um, and so um, they remained silent, except for Gomez Pena, who would recite traditional stories in a fictitious, nonsensical language in return for donations, which is, you know, anyway. But most people did not realize that this was fiction. And in 1992, which is kind of mind blowing, you know, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, they did it in all these all these places, including the Whitney by any. <laughs> anyway, uh, and this this mentions that the criticism <clears throat> varied upon the location, <laughs> but what alarmed the artist most was the substantial public belief that performances were reality, and the substantial number of critics who critiqued their work as unethical due to its misrepresentation rather than to fully discuss its cultural and institutional critique. So anyway, um, uh, that's all. But, you know, um, I thought that was an interesting way to stop, start. Uh, welcome again. Um, so if we have Tammy and Lorraine who cannot speak, um, do you have any thoughts, Jeffrey, on... Uh, conviction or do you want to tell us about your um you know you like your arrest history yeah all my convictions uh, hello hello oh, hey, lorraine. hey i can hear lorraine <laughs> i got it figured out oh good welcome <laughs> well yeah welcome i'm the surrogate tammy I can't figure out why Tammy can't communicate with us. Well, do you guys like switched bodies or something? Tammy just made me the co-host because she can't get her microphone sorted out tonight. Huh. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Let's see. I had asked Jeff, Jeffrey if you wanted to say anything, so I definitely want to hear. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I didn't bring a piece of fiction, um, although I can I can tell a tell a little story. Um, about all the times I didn't get caught, um, <laughs> but that's not the same thing. Um, Oh my. I've been doing, I mentioned this to Richard earlier. I've, I've been doing uh, a, a uh, shadow transformation protocol that involves, it involved uh, somebody going on a journey to retrieve my shadow. Uh, or a shadow of mine, because <laughs> uh, there may be others, uh, and uh, and they transported it to an altar that I prepared, um, and then I journeyed to transfer the shadow into a mask, and so I have this mask. Um, and then I, I use Gabriel Roth's Five Rhythms uh, music to dance the shadow. I wear the mask, ask, ask the shadow to inhabit my body and to move with me uh, and, and dance, dance my body. Um, and the, the Five Rhythms, it starts out with a flowing rhythm, then moves into a staccato, 
and each section is about five minutes long, moves into staccato and then chaos, and then chaos transitions to lyrical, and then that transitions to silence, which isn't really silence, it's but it's a smoother. Um, and at that point, I request the shadow to go back into the mask and I take it off and I reflect upon what I what I've learned from my shadow. Um, and I learned two things. Um, one, I had images come up of when I was two um, and my sister was born and how I had this tremendous anger at my mother for abandoning me for this new baby. But that was immediately, I, I was immediately taught that, that I needed to love and protect my sister. Huh. And so the anger got put into the into my shadow. Oh. Um, and uh, but along with that came sort of an intermixing of uh, of uh, anger or rage even and, and and rage that's constrained and uh, bound up and not allowed to be expressed. Uh, and that some of the love is also involved in that. Um, so that, that that was my first, in my first dance, that's what I learned about my shadow. Uh, in, in further dances, I actually got some ancestral uh, information. Um, and this is stuff I've, I've actually, I've done some ancestral work um, looking for ancestral trauma within my Scandinavian roots. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if I've shared my discovery. It, I said, well, at least we didn't have witch trials. Ha, huh. little did I know. I would immediately assume that you did, yeah. <laughs> yes. And there's actually a pretty complete account by the one of the matrons of this Swedish town. Um, this guy came in preaching that the town was infected with witches. And uh, this was in 1640 or thereabouts. And... Uh, and he he took the children and he, he he made a hole in the ice into the river and he plunged these children in until they uh, until they you know told who the witch was in their family uh, which which they did. I'm getting an echo. I just let Tammy spawn in. There's a telephone number. It's Tammy. Uh, Tammy, you'll need to your volume. Okay. Go ahead. So in the in this in this city which is where my ancestors came from, they they found all these witches uh, and the family members had to turn the witches over. They were beheaded, stripped of their clothing by the families. And then the family, there was a funeral pyre and they had to burn them until they piled the bodies of their and this whole time, none of them, the, the person who was giving the account, 
nobody expressed any emotion about the fact that the women of their family were killed and thrown into the fire. They all just turned away and walked with no expression on their face. My God. When Cammy came on, I, I somehow missed the end of the part about what happened to the children thrown into the, the frozen. <laughs> well, they, they, they were pulled out and, and warmed up after they, after they, uh, pointed out who the witch was. Oh, that's how they got that. Yeah. So so that's from my way back family history. And I could, so that story is connected with my shadow from an ancestral side also. Mm -hmm. So I stand convicted of betrayal betrayal of those that I love and the the fear of the two-year-old that, that whatever I, strong anger or emotion that I express will harm those that I love. So anyway, that's what I've been getting out of my dancing with my oh, mask. So little. I, I thought, you know, no, joking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot, actually. That's amazing. Yeah. And my next, uh, there's a fire ritual I have to uh, perform. I'm, I have all the pieces of it, but I haven't yet done it. Um, I have to create a fire and I've crafted some uh, objects that have my beliefs um, and I'm gonna burn them, get rid of them. Um, and that's that. And that's the first step. Because next we look, turn to our pain and confusion of our shadow, and we have a water ritual for that. But we put tell the stories like the story I just told. I'm going to tell into a stone and into the river, the Trinity River, and uh, get rid of it, cleansing my ancestral line of that story. Well, I just hope there's not like a beheading ritual as well, because, you know. Right, right. We want to see you back here. <laughs> yeah, I won't. Um, Tammy, I had a thought. Um, You can hear us through your computer. The reason I think we were getting the echo was because you know, I think you can eliminate the echo if you take your phone and you turn down the volume, your hearing volume, like as if you can't. So you can't hear anything through your phone, but we'll still be able to hear you. And that that may um, so you don't have to be have the phone on mute if you don't have your volume on. I think that that'll uh, solve the that that trick. Well, that was an amazing tale, Lorraine. Tonight we're doing um, uh, pieces, be including whatever you feel like, but uh, that are about conviction or being convicted. Well, let's see. Do you want something political or personal? <laughs> the I political the, is the personal, isn't that I, what they said? <laughs> uh, maybe one of each. Was that too big a choice? No, no, no. Um, yeah. This one, it's called to 192 Nations. Let me, because things have changed so much in the last, like, over the past, over the past decade and more, that this is, this poem was written in, let me see, it was typed up in 2011. I have to refresh my memory on when the event happened. Um, yeah, 2011. Mm -hmm. It was executed on September 21st. It's called To 192 Nations. It's a poem for many voices. 
and a poem for Troy Davis. This day when you meet all you nations in the General Assembly in that ivory glass tower, will you dare speak against the U.S. for the execution, the murder of an innocent man last night? Or will you silence your mind, your souls? As you walk by the peaceful demonstrations on Wall Street being beaten and arrested, will you decry the U.S.'s human rights abuses? As you see the homeless on the streets, as you see the people hungry without work, without basic human rights, will you decry? You saw us beaten and tear gassed in Seattle in 99. You saw us beaten and tear gassed in St. Louis in 2000, in New York in 04, in Denver and St. Paul in 08. Did you decry? You saw elections stolen again and again. Did you decry? You saw that government bomb sovereign nations for decades, did you decry? Then invade on trumped up evidence, did you decry? You hear the veterans committing suicide, you hear the gay youth committing suicide, do you decry? Millions imprisoned the most of any nation on this earth, do you decry? The majority minorities in that nation, do you decry? You have welcomed millions of us who have gone into exile, do you decry? Yet you deny we are political refugees. These abuses have been going on for decades, for generations. Do you decry? Do you even cry? As you walk into that ivory glass tower, past bloody gasping demonstrators, past a thin hand held out for a piece of food, a piece of dignity, past headlines murmuring news of an innocent man assassinated by the state last night, Will you finally speak out against the U.S.'s human rights abuses? Or will you continue to cower in fear as many of its own citizens? When will you speak out against that inhumanity? Do you dare to decry? Dare to cry. Well, that was the fire, Lorraine. Wow. I love it when you set things on fire. That was amazing. Thank you. Maybe we could hear a political one as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a bad, a bad joke, but if you want to share another of that sort or a uh, different sort, please. So can the theme is can those convicted, eh? Well, or or conviction. Or convictions. Okay, let's see. This kind of goes back, um, Jeffrey, to what you were talking about. This is called Curse. Those many years ago, we played at being witches, dipping our toes, our fingertips into the dark waters of the spirit world. In those days, you cursed me, 
for de denying you your man, the father of your child, my husband. These many years have passed, and I know not whatever happened to you or your curse. Do you still breathe life into it, dipping your toes, your fingertips in those ebon waters, mirroring an absent moon? Did you forget to dispel it, forget all about it? Or have you simply abandoned that realm? When does a curse die, wither away from seer neglect? Can it? Or like a bisaria, does it lie dormant in the weave of the life cloth until some thought of hate or regret wetens it, resurrects it, wiggling to the skins of my being? to again infect my world. I think of how different my life would have been if this had not happened or that, but I cannot take them back, nor would I want to. They were lessons I needed to learn. And do you still curse me for the lessons you were to learn? for denying you your man, the father of your child, my then husband. When does a curse die? Oh, you, you ended with my favorite line. <laughs> the curse lives on in, in that poem. Yeah. What was that? I said, the curse lives on in that poem. So I, I, uh, I did grab a couple, you know, uh, upon reflection, I do have a, a couple of, of my own pieces that, um, that would apply to the theme. Uh, and I also have a rather elaborate arrest story um but what i first thought to do was um pull out so this is an anthology um that came out a couple of years ago from colossus press uh freedom it's called and it's um voices across the carceral wasteland so it's not all people who are incarcerated uh but some of the people in here in the anthology are and some are writing about people they know who have been incarcerated and then some re related subjects and i hadn't opened it for a while so i i <clears throat> but i i did you know the half hour before we started and chose a couple um that that had struck me before and struck me again today um so i'd like to read two pieces uh one is um by a poet named Georgina Marie, uh, who I may still be the poet laureate of Lake County, California. I'm not 100% sure if she still is. And what's to, slightly interesting to me is that um, when I met Georgina Marie several years ago, she was she had a third name, which was her you know, surname, her last name, but I have, haven't seen her use it for a while. And curiously, she actually explains that in this poem, which I had not caught before. I must have, whatever, for whatever reason. <laughs> Namesake. We don't openly tell others of your living situation. Concrete floors, stainless steel bars. I'm sorry to feel so much shame. Assault with a deadly weapon doesn't serve well as dinnertime conversation. And when did we last have a family meal anyway? I deposited funds for your commissary. Though I've heard being the largest women's correctional facility, your prison housing has a limited supply of feminine, fe excuse me, feminine hygiene products, thanks to the rule of a male warden's discretion. 
If women don't matter on the outside, do they matter in Central Valley cages? Protest leads to mistreatment. Complaints yield meals served on plastic trays of retaliation. When you birthed your fifth daughter, did they offer holy water in a weaponless container? <clears throat> Was a blessing offered before separation of church and state, of law and parenthood? Did you ever know your name is of ancient European origins, meaning nobility? Our last name of the Spanish guadar, to guard. Pardon me if I mispronounce that a little. Your daughter's name, Old English, meaning ash, forest glade. I avoid sharing my surname at all costs. And she has someone else's now. I that just it give me goosebumps, you know. Anyway. And I just realized something else. Well, okay, I'm not going to go into that. And let's see, let me quickly, I can quickly find the other one, I'm certain. <clears throat> I'm going to take a little risk reading this one. Because it reads to me like a rap or hip hop poem, which I'm not particularly versed in reading. Um, but uh, that's okay. And this is definitely, I like to read this and then read the, um, the author's biography bio from the back, because it's at least as intense as the poem. And this is from a convict uh, by the name of Jesse Milo, um, J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Okay, I, I believe it's a, 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 a man's name, a male name. It's called Freedom Chaser. Community cages for the faceless, urban relocation based on races. Stop resisting, I'll tase you. Shoot you in your back, cage you. Take you away from your family, enslave you. Our bodies are commodities, state properties. How long has it been since you thought of me? Well, 174, 174, still tether me to the concrete floor. And I chase freedom. I chase freedom after my freed brothers till I meet them. I sit in my cage reading, thinking and dreaming. Filing habeas is competing for freedom against the ghost of my past, trying to move fast because I don't know how long my future will last. So each day I pave the way by scraping sand with my hands to give us marbles a better shot. Colossus, I am just trying to get back the life that I lost. Mm. Um, and uh, Jesse Milo, and then I, I don't know why I did this, but I. Because I'd read that piece before, and then I thought, what's his bio? <laughs> and it's quite a bio. They actually allow a sort of long bios in this. And here's what it says, and then I'll, we'll move on. Jesse Milo was sentenced to death by incarceration at the age of 22 for attempted murder. He is two decades into a 200-year-plus Six life sentence with no hope for parole in this life. Despite this hopeless sentence, he's a contributing writer for Prison Journalism Project and a column titled Freedom Road. He is a volunteer senior inside organizer for initiatejustice.org um, and a member of the Inmate Scholars Program. Sign the petition to support Jesse's release at and there's a long, long address. It gets lonely in the struggle. Be sure to include your phone number as Jesse can't email back. Quote, I see a pattern in our community, in our family. Just weeks prior to my crime, a cousin was shot and killed by one of my friends. He was the second cousin to be murdered in the street by a person with a gun. My nephew murdered my uncle last year, and a few months ago, my baby brother was just arrested for murder. His wife just gave birth to his son, Noah, and the beat goes on. Our father was in prison when we was growing up, and when I got life, my dad discharged parole. We traded spots. It seems incarceration is a beast that enjoys feeding on my family. My cousin Petey's in Ironwood prison, and so is his dad, Big Pete, serving 400 years in Stockton. My sister noted recently, all the males in our family are in jail. 
I told her, sensing her guilt, uh, she, uh, the commonality isn't in our blood. It's drug addiction, which equals crime incarceration. We experience trauma, self-medicate to cope and bond with family, and we go to jail. So where does it end? Our vengeful hearts allow us to ease up penalties for the nonviolent person. But at some point, we have to face the truth that even a violent offender who's sentenced to die in jail has a family who needs him and his absence leaves a family broken. Rinse, recycle, repeat. Empty the cage, fill the cage, empty the rage, and let love in. What a bio. I know. I thought that was worth, oh, this is Colossus Press. Oh, I, I think I was looking earlier. Okay, yeah, it's right there. Sorry, there. So, their other anthologies are uh, uh, Colossus Home, which was um, uh, for about um, homeless uh, families, and uh, Colossus Body, which is about uh, bodily autonomy, and all their profits, all. Well, hundred they're having to change this because they don't have any money left, but all of their process profits, a hundred percent of them have gone to uh, selected uh, nonprofits uh, in the um, arena that the that the stuff is in. So um, yeah, I'm a fan. They have a new one they're going to announce the theme for soon. Um, looking to see if it says where the profits to this one go to but I, I don't see it on here anyway Ooh. Tammy Gomez are you able to talk to us do you think <laughs> you're kind of a, a little imprisoned today. <laughs> you are in, in carceral in a box you okay? Well, folks, what shall we do next? Can you unmute yourself, Tammy? Or unmute your phone? I think you can, Tammy. I think it'll be fine. Yes. Oh, please. Do I need to let you share your screen? I think you should be able to share. Yeah. Yeah. One of us will read. Not me. Maybe. <laughs> we'll be together. A multi-voice poem. A poem for many voices. Yes. I was at a reading earlier today, and the, some of the folks tried to do an impromptu sing-along, but they hadn't prepared at all, so they couldn't remember the words, and they were scattered in a book, and they couldn't find the pages. And so, like, every minute or two, they'd come up with another phrase, and the woman would say how to sing it, and then we'd all sing it for just a moment, and then there'd be, like, two minutes of them fumbling in the pages. <laughs> what, was the, what was the song you guys were trying to sing? It was actually the... Um, it was she put the entire um I'm, oh my god i'm so being so dumb um like uh it's the like universal statement of human rights that started I, the united nations i'm forgetting the title universal declaration of human rights exactly she, this woman had put it to music but in in a certain way and they had a book of it but it wasn't very easy to use i guess but it was a very cool idea do you have your screen share uh, prepared, Tammy?
would you like, um, who should read this? It doesn't work to have everybody read it because whoever has the loudest voice at a, any given moment is the one who comes through. So I've tried to do that before, everybody doing something together. And it, no, no, no. Put it back up. Um, you want us all to try? We can try. I don't want to disappoint Why don't we you. take turns by paragraphs? Yeah. Yeah, we can do it that way. Lorraine, will yeah, you start? Each person read three paragraphs. No. No. Put it back up. Let's see. Let's see if it works. No. <laughs> Jeffrey isn't Jeffrey isn't judge <laughs> and executioner here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me. I stand convicted. <laughs> oh, come on, Tammy, put it back up and we'll try and read it. I'm curious now to see if that will work or not, or how it'll work. Come on, I only got like about six or seven paragraphs into it. <laughs> like to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh if we will give you time to decide, Tammy, or find one. Um, either of you guys want to share anything? I could certainly tell my arrest story. Um, I've got one I can share. Please. This is called Archivo de la Memoria. It's... um about a place in Cordoba, Argentina. Walking into that centuries-old building through a wall torn down to reveal the memories of that dark, dirty war. The testimonies of survivors splayed through the air and the memories that still hang heavy I sense those spirits waiting on concrete benches, cowling in pain in small windowless cells, names, dates scratched in the plaster, bodies dragged through the maze of narrow corridors. The memories shoved me out the doorways of that subterranean torture chamber and that one at the top of steep stairs. I hear those screams, those thuds, slam, slam, slamming my head against the in invisible, palpable walls echoing around me from every corner within this archives of memory. Mm. It's um, Archivo de la Memoria is the name that they gave to a former torture center of the Argentine dictatorship. That's now a museum. Would not have done that. That was intense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very powerful. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll tell my arrest story, I think, because it's it, it, it's kind of interesting and it's a little bit of history that no one really knows about. Unless I've told it here before, but I don't recall doing so. 
<laughs> one, um, one thing. Yeah. Remember, this is being recorded. Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah, it's a good thing that it is. Um, <clears throat> since this bit of history got somehow sort of erased. So um, uh, Rodney King conviction comes through April. I just want to double check the date. That was April 29th, 1992. And um, I'm not sure. I think the protests and riots started that night in Los Angeles. At that time, I was in San Francisco, living in San Francisco. On the night of, I was at, coincidentally out at a bar and it, you know, like a club and it's not like anyone made the an announcement and I wasn't aware of it till the next day, but the night of there was a, a spontaneous protest in San Francisco that um, started in the Western edition, which was the most central um, uh, black neighborhood at that time um, and, uh, and marched all around and ended up at city hall with a giant demonstration that was completely unplanned. And um, and the demonstration got very rowdy and broke up, and then all kinds of groups ran around, um, like uh, smashing windows and breaking into Macy's and things like that. And it was, you know, some general uh, un unrest. I, I wasn't aware of that uh, because I was <laughs> drinking in a club, which, uh, uh, anyway. But uh, I, I certainly learned when I got home the next night. So the mayor of San Francisco um, and I'm trying to think of his damn name. Um, uh, if it comes to me, I could look it up, but um, declares uh, martial law and uh, for the next night. And that meant that um, after 9 p.m., there were a couple that I remember, a couple stipulations. One was that there could be no public gathering um, and that um, period um, and uh, and that out that after 9 p.m. there was a curfew which stated that you could be on the streets but you needed to be on your way somewhere so <clears throat> there was a another protest plan for 24th admission um and you don't really have to know the geography here but you know i'll mention a couple of the places uh and um at I want to say six or seven, and I went down to it, um, and there were a few hundred people there, um, but it, it didn't stay at 24th and Mission, which is a BART station. It's, we just started marching down Mission Street after a short while. People said a piece that we're going to march down and again to City Hall and gather people along the way. But um, so, yeah, we were um, not technically not supposed to have a, a public gathering, uh, but we did. And we got a block or two down Mission Street and found ourselves surrounded by hundreds of cops in riot gear from all over the place. OK. And um, and we were, uh, you know, arrested. We were sort of hit with nightsticks and, and arrested and taken away. But um, and what they did at that. This is a, a common maybe you all are familiar with this tactic. It's, a, it's an urban tactic for. Uh, things like rowdy protests out of, you know, uh, um, un, uh, rowdy protests, let's just say generally. So they take us um, and they they take us to one of the piers uh, at the time uh, along the bay, an unused, a big empty pier. The city must have held it. And we're put in there for many hours. And there actually had sort of corrals in it, like fenced off areas so that we weren't all one big mass of people there, you know, so, but as we're there, they're bringing more and more people in unbeknownst to us because we were the first group to get arrested. But after they arrested, and this is the weirdest part, they arrested the protest, which was, you know, there, there were probably 100, 200, you know, not that I don't think it was, I don't recall it being huge. They then um, marched down Mission Street, which is, uh, you know, the um, uh, the Latinx uh, um, area, it, even back then, even more so of a lot of different cultures and uh to um 18th street turned left on 18th street went by mission dolores and went up to castro street and they they about 15 city blocks they arrested everyone walking down the street for no reason whatsoever this is with the and like literally after a while people were showing up on the pier going what the fuck just happened you know i people with groceries in their arms moms 
you know, people on their way home from work. It made zero sense. They were practicing to see how many people they could arrest in a short amount of time. They 15, like 15 city blocks. And so here's the interesting thing. Another interest, the next interesting thing is that normally what they do for a rowdy protest, say, they'll keep you there until the middle of the night. You're tired, cold and hungry, and they let you go in small groups to make your way home. Obviously, your, you know, ire has dissipated. Does this sound familiar? It's an urban tactic. So so they started doing that in the middle of the night and letting us out in groups of like 10 or 20. And um, and they took our, our photographs on the way out um, against uh, like a. I forget what you call it, where you know where you get pho photographed for like for being arrested, but they took our photographs, let us outside, and then immediately cuffed us and put us in buses and drove us across the bay to Santa Rita Prison, which had just finished being built. It wasn't even in use yet, and within several hours, they booked eight hundred people into Santa Rita Prison, and we stayed there for two and a half days and weren't allowed phone calls, and we were all arrested on several charges. Not really with very very few exceptions none of which were true um and it was so it was basically an illegal mass arrest and uh i mean very clearly i mean and i know this because i ended up in a sort of pod cell pod area with like a whole variety of people who were just going about their business like they're in mine there were several i mean this is like a bunch of cells that have with a common area there were several journalists like one from money magazine and one from this and this who were just in town i mean what an idiotic thing to do is you know illegally arrest journalists from big publications but they it was it was okay so it's a mystery whoever made the decision is 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 it you know so Anyway, after a couple of days, they let us go. I can't even remember. They like, took us back to 650 Bryant and then just let us go home from there. And nobody knew what happened to us. You know, my I missed a couple of nights of work at the, a club I worked at, so forth. Okay, so, um, and um, word gets out about this. <laughs> and about a week and a half later, um, the weekly, which I, think was the Bay Guardian at the time, you know, like the sort of like weekly culture and blah, blah magazine that's free around San Francisco publishes a um, publishes a huge article about it. And on the front cover, and I, I got one because they delivered them on in like the middle late at night to the bar I was cleaning up. And so we got a stack and it was Richard Hungisto was the chief of police. And the, I don't know why I'm doing this, but it was a big size cover and before Photoshop. So it's a collage of Richard, Richard Hungisto kind of masturbating with a, a billy club with a nightstick. And the headline was Dick's cool new tool, martial law. And it was a huge article about this. So these are the kind of papers that go into the um you know into the the receptacles along the street and they're free and you can pick one up the next morning they just distribute them at like three four in the morning um and so i got one and everyone i worked at the paradise and some people got one but by the next morning by the next morning dawn all of those paper uh boxes were empty they mm -hmm. all like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them disappeared that night they were by the way found of course people had some you could distribute them you know and take everything um they were found several months later in the basement of a policeman's house <laughs> okay so that's a true story it um they did it a couple at a couple of protests over the uh, there were protests about that that action you know and they kept doing it and then there was, uh, you know, a seven year lawsuit that resulted in the SFPD having to pay a million dollars out of its budget like seven years later. I lived in Austin at the time and I received a check for twelve hundred dollars in the mail from the San Francisco Police Department. All the charges were dropped, uh, but it took a long time for them to clear the records that you were arrested. Here's the final this is like the little sort of Dunya uh, coda to that. So I'm in um, Brooklyn, living in Brooklyn many years later, and I get a, a jury duty 
and I go to the you know borough hall and I get into the jury pool in a courtroom um, and there's a few hundred jurors in there and it's tough, going to be a tough case. I remember pretty clearly because it hinged on uh, like a small girl, like five years old, maybe or less, who called the police saying that she was being molested by her uncle. Uh, and um, but it was like the only witnesses were the very young girl and the one cop who came to the apartment. And there was, you know, uh, uh, anyway, I end up in the jury box and they ask me and the whole room's filled with prospective jurors. And they ask everybody, they, is there any reason that you might not trust the word of a policeman? And I say, um, I have known a few policemen over the years who I thought were fine individuals, but yes, there's one incident that I had that would make me question, um, you know, just based on that. And they said, can you tell us what that was? And I said, it's kind of a long story. I literally said that to the lawyer and he's like, no, just tell us. So I told them the whole story. I just told you the whole courtroom and I finished and there's silence. And the lawyers go up to the judge's bench and he dismisses every potential juror in the room. Like I was a very popular person in the hallway a minute later because I got like almost 200 people, 150 people, whatever it was, um, uh, dismissed because I had tainted the jury pool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my whole story. But it was, I thought, you know, so if you try to look up that you can't you can't find much in the history books about that that illegal mass arrest they were practicing to see how quickly they could arrest 800 people and how quickly they could book them into the new prison which hadn't yet been used mm -hmm. santa rita mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. i was first on the bunk yeah <laughs> Did anybody see the, I can't remember it was the New York Times or the Washington Post had a story about all the police officers who abuse children and get off. Um, and and it, it, it had a couple of case cases that they shared, you know, where uh, the they the police regularly get off from those charges even even when there's evidence and everything else they that they'll do a plea bargain and uh and get sentenced to five years and that's all the 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 families of the people who've been abused know but then they're given probation the whole thing's just probated and they're they're free, um, and they often go on. They they go to a police department somewhere else, like the Catholic Church. Church, and they're they're exactly they're like the priests. Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn. I just remembered a second coda to that story. I don't usually tell it. Um, so it was even after the jury, I was teaching at Pratt. I was teaching in New York. I was teaching at, among other, at Pratt Institute. And I was teaching for a couple of semesters, a few semesters, I was teaching a sort of a special class, uh, which was, um, I was uh, for first year architects students. Uh, and um, first year architecture school at a school like Pratt is, is brutal, like, 50% dropout. They kick the shit out of these kids. They give them more work than they could possibly do. And they wanted their writing to be better anyway. So they took some of the better writing teachers and they paired us with um, architecture teachers who were teaching like a first year theory. They actually were teaching from like a graduate level uh, book of architectural theory whatever um and so we would read along we would read the stuff and then they would assign papers and we would help like they would be in class for three hours on a thursday afternoon and then we would come in for the fourth hour and try to help them with their papers and they were all they were you know half half alive at that point it was a tough tough class so about halfway through the semester and we you know we did the best we could but these kids were 
exhausted by the time we'd walk in the room. And, you know, I had a room without windows you could open. And, you know, it's like, I was surprised they didn't suffocate eventually. But halfway through the semester, they're, you know, we're trying to trying to have a discussion. They're allowed to take any piece of theory that they'd read. And we I'd read them all. And they had to just write a paper applying that idea to a real place. And one of them was uh, Foucault's Panopticon, which is about an idea of a uh, of, of an architectural space in which it's a central area, like where the people in the central area can see everyone else. And that's how this prison was designed. And it actually was designed, it, 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 the same design occurs in this old HBO show called Oz, which I only recommend if you don't mind really, really brutal, horrible things done by men to each other in a prison. But, you know, um, anyway, so... Uh, and so the one of the students raises his hand, one of the sort of like more alert students, but everyone's like, yeah. and he says, I've been watching this show Oz um, and I and it's like that essay by Foucault. And do you think he would let me do, um, you know, do a paper on the environment in the show rather than a real building? And I said, um, uh, I said, well, actually, that the prison in that is based on a real types of prisons that started getting built in the early 90s. And I sort of went on and described, you know, the idea that that's what Santa Rita was like and this and that. And and um, and somebody says, how do you know so much about that? And I say, well, because I was in one. <laughs> <laughs> and I had I, I swear to God, and I, I was like, oh, fuck. That was not the thing to say to the students, but they were so alert for about two weeks, two, three weeks after that. They were like, he's been in prison. He's been in prison. <laughs> I said, yeah, we can talk. I'll tell you about that sometime over drinks. The the implication being you're not old enough to drink. <laughs> so. All right, I've talked too much, but true story. Tammy, do you have some something you want to put on screen for us? Did you decide on something? I'll volunteer ne next time to be on mute the whole time. <laughs> Wow. For those watching, we're discussing something private in the chat that deserves a minute of silence. Tammy, is that where you got the idea for the theme? No, coincidence.
Mm-hmm. Just to add, they they might owe that cousin an apology as well. Here we go. I'm going to read this piece by Tammy uh, Gomez. Uh, I'll just read what's on the screen and feel free to scroll. I just sent a poem critique to a Cambodian man serving two consecutive life sentences in a Minnesota prison. I have reached out to touch Murder man from Murderland alone. Do you see the island there? The one floating in blood. He wants to touch my shore. I think he did. One time on Saturday, distant like pandemic pals, his words made stepping stone path from his earth to my soil, sullen sand, turf we tired out fighting about, so we share. There is nothing but time. <clears throat> Sitting in emptiness, a vacuum, don't you hear it deafening you? When I hit send, he cannot reply. I write, I hope your hands are open. Can your eyes close to unforgotten corpses haunting your dear tear ducts, ruptured heart? I don't cry either. What is the reason? The sadness of the truth cannot fade. We only jump the page with digits and words, hoping to landlock our way to sealed hurt with poems sailed by sudden gusts of discerning vision and verbal gumption for soft, merciful moments. We tender to each other these free-form phrases 
that feel like release from chains of human life pain. Simply utter a few pages of liberating consecutive sentences. Tammy Gomez, y'all. Thank you. Honored to read that. How's everyone feeling? Besides intense. Lorraine, Jeffrey, anything you'd like to share? I think this is probably one of the heaviest topics for a recordando reading that we've ever had. Definitely. Oh, I get that, Tammy. But we don't need to linger the whole time. Mm -hmm. I've had a long, you know, day. I'm anxious about. I'm not anxious. My project has been kind of consuming me, though. Oh, Lorraine, you don't know my little project, but uh, um, I found I found myself. Um, uh, I I call, actually in my mind I think of it as television creep, <laughs> meaning when I was younger I really didn't watch television and yeah uh, and but over the last ten years in my fifties a little more in the evening and I play video games and now for quite some time I've been spending a lot of hours every week sitting in front of the television in the evenings saying oh my brain is tired it's okay and I got pissed off at that and I felt started feeling very controlled and so you know on June 1st I took my television down and um decided to go I decided to go on a 12 month video fast where I'm not allowed to have a working television in my apartment and uh and for some reason I decided to chronicle what that does to me in terms of whatever cleaning my brain out or I don't know uh, in a podcast so I've done like three podcasts um and you know I have like 20 hours extra time per week technically but um I seem to be spending at least eight of them putting together and recording this podcast because I'm not that quick about it yet but it's making me write more and I'm getting faster at it you know and anyway yeah. Between that and trying to find some paid work, I'm like, yeah, I mean, well, the podcast, you have a podcast host. I used one called Buzzsprout, um, uh, which uh, apparently is a popular one, but they had a lot of uh, YouTube video, like videos on showing you how to set things up but also even a good one how to use the recording uh software uh the free recording software at least just for podcasts i mean you can do lots with it so uh, i kind of learned by by watching and that but then you have to you really have to lit you know some of it is you got to listen to make sure it all sounds that sounds all even and that sort of thing so um and i don't have the best ears I know they're kind of cute, but they're really not the best. <laughs> I've been I've been listening, and I can attest yeah. that he does a very good job. Uh, it, his voice is perfect for it. Thank you. Yes, uh, Jeffrey Pullis actually decided to donate a subscription to it, so um, I've got like. I've actually got like thirty dollars a month coming in from it, <laughs> which will pay for pays for the 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 fee I have to pay them and a little tiny bit extra. But so that's my new job. <laughs> no, but um, yeah. 
what I'm hoping is that it'll open up, that I will sort of, it'll open up a lot of other projects. That's kind of, you know, plus finding work, but, you know. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> I like the confetti one. Anyway, yes, this was a heavy one, but I'm glad. You know, I mean, we you don't you don't want to turn your we don't I don't want to turn my head from things. You know, we have to occasionally take a little rest from the from the shadow. You know, but um, don't want to deny it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, Lorraine, you just, if, if you look if you look around wherever you are, it's all going on here. Wherever you are, it's going on. The, the in, incarceration is such a crime. Uh, our oh, whole, itself. yeah, our whole so-called criminal justice system is criminal and not and unjust. Yep. What were you going to ask me, Richard? I was going to ask you a very tangential question to move off the subject. <laughs> uh, I wondered, um, you know, I don't ask ever ask where you are, but I wondered, just given what you were reading tonight, if you were familiar with people from Argentina. Um, I had the occasion recently to have little sort of dates uh, or play dates depending with two different Argentine men and I, I, I I'm, it's dawning on me that they might be the handsomest men I've ever seen <laughs> and I wondered if that was if you any if you or anyone here knows why Argentine men are so handsome <laughs> well maybe because so many of them are of Italian descent oh maybe it's still I don't necessarily I didn't think, oh, you look so Italian, you know, but I think whatever it is, it's a good blend. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just fixated for a minute because I also had two very nice dates with a guy from Taiwan. And that's kind of the one I'd rather continue <laughs> with. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> Italian. So there were a lot of Italians that settled into uh, Argentina. Yeah, mm -hmm. including some of my relatives. Huh. Yeah, I don't, I guess I wouldn't have known that, you know, bit of um, uh, soci sociology history. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Did you get one? Let's see. <laughs> I'm clicking on it. We're all clicking on to it. <laughs> <laughs> According to Quora.com. I love Quora. Why yeah. are Ar Argentine men so hot? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Not Latino. We already know that. Argentine. I'm I'm more specific. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what? I'm coming back to the Zoom. <laughs> I'm going to leave that on my screen for later amusement since I'm not allowed to watch, you know, <laughs> track anymore. <laughs> I, I have to, I, I have to um, uh, be a bit uh, uh, not quite in agreement with some of the things this person says. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Quora is for. <laughs> yeah. The, the the interesting thing, this the person writing this for those who are listening to us. Yeah. There's no racism against blacks. <clears throat> no okay. police executing motorists. They say that there's no blacks in Argentina, but there's 
an interesting reason for that. There was a yellow fever outbreak in Buenos Aires and the the Rio de la Plata river basin. And so the rich people went to a cooler climes where there was no yellow fever and left their slave household members to watch the houses who then died in the yellow fever outbreak. And any blacks that come in from Brazil or other neighboring countries aren't really welcomed that well. Well, that sounds familiar. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, that's a heavy piece of history. Yes, it's a very heavy piece of history. That's why all those German Nazis went to Argentina after the war. <laughs> One of the reasons. Yeah. And also because uh, Peron um, invited them. He said that, that they could come, which was really a weird thing because you think of Peron as being very left wing, but he invited the Nazis to come and hide out. So I am nominating this record, Ando, for the heavy award. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Noreen actually already did, but yeah. What's that? I think I said I said I'm nominating this record Ando, for the heavy award, but then I said no, I think Lorraine already did that. Yeah. Just for it being uh, a little more hard-edged than some. Well, and just wait wait until the uh, third Saturday of November and we'll see. See how heavy we get. <laughs> One moment. It's interesting to read these uh, comments. Are you talking about because it's election month? Yes. <laughs> okay. I see. Well, that's only the first Tuesday. The third Saturday is the 16th. Oh, okay. I'll be able to come to that one. Which, unless, which unless month I'm is that? Gulag, you know, huh? Which, oh, that's in November? Yeah, we have the presidential election and, you know. Right. Yeah. We may all be asking you for advice of where to resettle. I am, I am getting my passport renewed. I'll tell you that much. I got some friends in Canada. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, like what's happening in Europe is with their elections is quite interesting. Never claim to understand the species. Human beings are one. I don't know. Well, I'm going to only watch soccer on television. My... <laughs> There's lots of soccer on television starting now. Is there? Yeah. The Euro and the Copa America and the Olympics all have soccer games. So I can, you can, there's probably five or six games every day. That's the one where they kick each other? Right, exactly. Well, that's a, what, no, the one where they kick each other is rugby. Oh, right. I think. Which is which is quite a popular sport in Argentina. Is it? Yeah. I'm really just, I say things like that because I don't like organized sports and team sports. So I, I'm like. Is that the one with the square ball or the one with the net? Or, <laughs> you know, I know what they are, but you know, I'm just hoping someone will threaten me. 
Um, yeah, well, let's wind down. Um, this has been a, an intense um, couple of hours. Uh, I got to thank Tammy Gomez for continuing to organize these with all of, you know, with all the heart in the world. And, you know, we missed your, we missed your golden tones tonight. Mm. You know, get that, get that microphone fixed. Get it, get it sorted out, my friend. Mm. We need to hear you. Also very good to see Jeffrey and, and always good to hear um, you, Lorraine, both your work and your perspectives. Thank you okay. for creating the space, hosting yeah. tonight, and, and Tammy for creating the space, Monte and <laughs> we'll, we'll see each other from the third Saturday of July, um, if not sooner. Until then, nam namaste. And um, yeah, I think we can stop recording. <laughs>